Hello, um, <clears throat> this is the continuation of the first video on Matthew 11, 28, verses 28 through 30. So I suppose we'll, I was going to start with 2 Peter, <laughs> but I suppose I'll flip back to the scripture so that way we can kind of have that as our guidepost, if you will. Um, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you, take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so, um, we left off with Isaiah 55, you know, with his word not returning to him void, and, you know, how... Um, he watches over his word, and let's see. So I wanted to start, because he wants all, us all, to come to repentance. And so this isn't, this is free. That's that's why I keep really, oh, I forgot to pray, but um, I suppose maybe I should do that first. I apologize. <laughs> I feel like my whole life is a prayer sometimes, y'all, so... Because I just feel like I'm in constant communication. Um, I've been accused of people like, how can I yourself in there? <laughs> no, but God's talking to me and he's cracking me up right now. <laughs> um, so there you go. Lord, Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you for this opportunity again to uh, speak your word and to, to invite everybody to come to you, Lord, because this is what you want, Lord. So I just... I bless you, and I just love you, and I adore you, and I thank you, I praise you, I give you all glory, and honor, and praise, and thanksgivings for all that you are, and all that you do, and always will. I thank you in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, amen. All right, <clears throat> so, um, and if people are wondering why I don't really ask him for much, it's because I, I just expect it. That's why. Um, I just thank him and praise him and just expect that whatever he is trying to say will be said. Hallelujah and amen. And this, so this is Second Peter 3. And the verse that I um, am I'm focusing on is verse 9. The Lord does not delay in his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so... The beginning of the chapter, it's it's labeled the day of the Lord. Dear friends, this is now the second letter I have written to you. In both letters, I want to develop a genuine understanding with a reminder. I love this. I love that they, you know, wrote letters to each other for us to be able to look in and say, well, what's going on, you know, that he felt he had to write that letter? Like, what can I glean from this? It says, so that you can remember the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the command of our Lord and Savior given through your apostles. First, beware of this. Scoffer will come in, la in the last days to scoff, living according to their own desires, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. They willfully ignore this. Long ago, the heavens and the earth were brought from about from water and through water by the word of God. Through these waters, the world at that time perished when it was flooded. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Dear friends, don't let this one thing escape you. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years in a thousand years, like one day, the Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, it is clear 
what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for the earnest or wait for and earnestly desire the coming of the day of God. The heavens will be on fire and dissolve, be dissolved because of it, and the elements will melt with heat. But based on his promises, we wait for the new heavens and the, a new earth will right, where righteousness will dwell. It says, therefore, dear friends, dear me familia, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found at shalom with him without spot or blemish. Also regard the patience of our Lord as an opportunity for salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul has written to you, according to the wisdom given to him, he speaks about these things in all his letters, in which there are some matters that are hard to understand. The untaught and unstable twist them to their own destruction, as they also do with the rest of the scriptures. Therefore, dear friends, since you know this in advance, be on guard that you are not led astray by the error of lawless people, and fall from your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. And I love how it says, you know, it gives you all these commands. Like, well, you know, he says all these things, right? And he's, you know, exhorting them to, you know, just like as I would like to do myself, you know, like by the power of God, though. But he says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord's spirit. You know, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it's because it's in the gift of Him and the gifts that He gives us that we're able to grow. It's not something we can do by ourselves. It's by the grace of God. And that's a good thing. This is a good thing. That's why His yoke is easy. We and, you know, um, religious people put these burdens on people. And it's not what Jesus is trying to do. And I'm grateful that I get to be a steward of that because I was under that my whole life. And that is why when I arrived here, I had flipping off God. I didn't believe in faith because of the fact that um, I just had been burdened <laughs> by my own sins, by the sins of others, and by religious people that just putting more burdens on than they couldn't even carry themselves. And so in Galatians 6, 9, um, I love what he says. It says, the one who is taught, actually, you know what, I kind of want to start at the beginning because um, it's very short as well. Galatians 6, it says, carry, because I, I started a little bit on this earlier in the other video. It says, brothers, if someone is caught in any wrongdoing, you are, you who are spiritual should restore such a person with a gentle spirit. Watching out for yourself so you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each person should examine his own work. And then he will have reason a reason for boasting in himself alone and not in respect to someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. And so <clears throat> that's when we're able to go and say, hey, brother, you know, I see. And I, you know, and we gently correct him. We don't, we're not, you know, first off, we're not God, but also God doesn't even do that. Like he gently is like, come on, you know, just come and confess. That's it. It says the one who has taught the message must share all his good things with the teacher. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap corruption from the flesh. The one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. So it says we must not get tired of doing good. For we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. It says therefore as we have an opportunity we must work for the good of all especially for those who belong to the household of faith did you see that it says for the good of all not for the good of my community not for the good of you know my church you know i mean it does say that too you know it says especially for those in the household of faith but that's you know faith is a gift and so if we're keeping people from that, because they're weak in faith, 
you know, then then you're not a household of faith. Because that's, that's not what it says, you know. Um, we're supposed to be working for the good of all people because that's what Jesus came for, is for the world. And it also says in um, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians one twenty. It says, for every one of God's promises is a yes in him. Therefore, the amen is also spoken through him by us for God's glory. Now it is God who strengthens us with you in Christ and has anointed us. He has also sealed us and given us the spirit as a down payment in our hearts. It says, I call on God as a witness in my life that it was to spare you I did not come to Corinth. This is Paul speaking. He says, I didn't, do not mean that we have control of your faith, but we are workers for you with your joy. With you for your joy. Because you stand by faith. I love that. Like they are, you know, that's what Paul's whole ministry was. Was, you know, he said for him death was gain. But that while he was in this body that he he had to make known the promises and, and the you know, his ministry to people to share the good news and the gospel. Um, in Philippians, he says he's going to complete it. Jesus does. Um through Paul, <laughs> um, says in Philippians 1, 6, it says, well, actually, I'm going to start verse 3. It says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He says, it is right for me to think this way about all of you because I have you in my heart and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and establishment of the gospel. The gospel. Oh, I love this. He says, for God is my witness, how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. He says, and I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment so that you can approve the things that are superior and be pure and blameless in the day of Jesus, the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, the glory and praise of God. I love that. And then he just goes on, you know, and to all the things, all the trials and all the things that he had gone through, you know, is actually an advance um, to the gospel. And that's actually what he goes into what I was just talking about. He says, for me, um, and, and this is verse Philippians 1, 21. It says, For me, living is Christ and dying is gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me, and I don't know which one I should choose. I am pressured by both. I have the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that you will remain and continue with all of you, for, or I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that because of me, your confidence may grow in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. It says just one thing, live your life in a matter worthy of the gospel of Christ. It says then whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, working side by side for the faith that comes from the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but for your deliverance, and this is from God. For it has been given to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. And he goes into chapter two, um, Christian humility, but he says he will complete it. He's, he's gonna, you know, he's faithful. I'm going to read that verse again. And I, <clears throat> it says, let's see what it says. Verse six. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah and amen. Um, in Romans 4, it's Paul again. Um, he's assured that will be, you know, the promise granted through faith. Um, let's see, I just want to make sure I get 
all the right verses that I'm just going to actually just start at verse 13. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that would inherit the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness that comes by faith, a gift of God. If so, I added that part. That's in Ephesians 2, um, 8 through 10. It's a gift. If those who are the law are heirs, faith is made empty and the promise is canceled. For the law produces wrath and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Isn't that great? With Jesus, there's no law. This is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace to guarantee it to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of Abraham's faith. He is the father of us all in God's sight. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He believed in God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that does not that do not exist. He believed, hoping against hope, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what he had been spoken, so will your descendants be. He considered his own body to be already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and also considered the deadness of Sarah's womb without weakening in faith. He, maybe we can say, consider the world around us, and the way the society works, and how we're guilty of participating in it. <laughs> And we cannot be wakened in our faith that God is, you know, going to restore and redeem and make it all right. No, just, he did not. It's just a question I'm asking. <clears throat> he did not waver in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was not fully convinced that what he had promised, he, because he was fully convinced rather, sorry, because he was fully convinced that what he promised he was also able to perform Therefore, it was credited to him for righteousness. Now it was credited to him. Now it was credited to him. It was not written for Abraham alone, but also for us. It will be credited to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And, you know, it just goes on. Faith triumphs in, in Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have shalom with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith, a gift of God, by grace, also a gift of God, into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, not only that but we also rejoice in our afflictions. Because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. He pours it out unto us. For while we were still helpless at the appointed moment, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for just for a just person. Though for a good person, perhaps one might even dare to die, but God proves his own love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? <clears throat> And it says, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have received this reconciliation through him. It says, you know, it talks about, you know, Adam and Eve. It says, you know, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin to in this way, death spread to all men because all sinned. In fact, sin was in the world before the law, but sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. He is a prototype of the coming one, but the gift is not like the trespass, for it, by one man's trespass the many died. How much more have the grace of God and the gift overflowed to many by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ? And the gift is not like the one man's sin, because one sin came from judgment, resulting in condemnation. But from many trespasses came the gift, resulting in justification. Since by the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more with those who received the overflow of grace 
and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah and amen. So then as through one trespass, there is condemnation for everyone. So also through one righteous act, through one righteous act, there is life giving justification for everyone, for everyone. For just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So also through the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The law came to multiply the trespass. But where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through the righteous, resulting in eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, uh, in Hebrews 10, he promised his faithful. I'm just going to, you know, he promises these things. And I, I just want to remind you that it's, it's not just me saying it. You know, scripture says he is faithful keep it. Um, Hebrews 10 and 23. Let's see. It says, therefore, I'm actually going to start at Hebrews 10, um, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, he has opened for us through the curtain. That is his <clears throat> flesh and since we have a great high priest over the house of god let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us be concerned about one another in order to and let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our worship meetings, not staying away, or sorry, not staying away from our worship meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hallelujah and amen. Um, I think I also had one, oh, verse 36, it says for you need endurance so that after you have done God's will, you may receive what is promised it says for yet in a very little while the coming one will come and not delay but my righteous one will live by faith and if he had if he draws back i have no pleasure in him but i love paul he goes but we are not those i agree we are not those who draw back and are destroyed but those who have faith and obtain life hallelujah and amen i agree with that um if we persevere we are blessed it says um love it and so, you know, um, he's not only saying come, you know, in those first verses and then, you know, in Revelations and Isaiah 55 and, you know, all the verses that he says, come all you, you know, and um, Revelations 3, it, he's actually also knocking, <laughs> um, you know, I've heard it says he's knocking on the door of your heart and, you know, maybe... Maybe that's kind of in a way true because um, that's the part he wants it's your heart um, let's see verse 20 it says listen I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and have dinner with him and he with me. The victor, I will give him the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also won the victory and sat down with my father on his throne. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the teachers. <sighs> you know, I actually kind of want to read a little bit of um, Revelation 3 because it's actually, it's one of my favorites. Um because this letter i love it because he's also telling you to come and buy gold from him so i'm just going to start at verse 14. this is um right to the angel of the church in laodicea and this is all the churches this is this is us too we need to listen to this too it says the amen the faithful and true witness the originator of god's creation says i know your works that you are neither cold nor hot I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. 
Because you say I'm rich. I become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't know that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise to you, I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, exposed and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. This is as many, many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. You know, Paul tells us that, um, in one of the scriptures, you know, that we should regard suffering as discipline and that, you know, um, It's a good thing. It means that, you know, God loves us, you know, like he disciplines. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be committed and repent. That's, and, before, and right after he says, so be committed and repent. It says, listen, I stand at the door and knock. He's knocking for you. It's not, he's not just telling you to come. He's also like kind of banged on the door. Um, God also restores. And so it may not happen immediately or quickly. And, and quite frankly, you may lose even more. And, um, but he does restore. He promises. He, you know, um, and he, he, he promised if we endure. And he helps us endure because his yoke is easy and light. It's the notes that I put. And, you know, um, a lot of people, you know, quote, you know, Jeremiah 29. I'm going to start at verse you know the plans that I have for you are to prosper you um, but you got to go you know you, you got to give up all the things to God you know we, we got to repent for all the things that we think we're hiding from him um, and and you know ask him to reveal to us too the things that are hidden because you know we can't even it, I, it even says in scripture you know who could know even hidden sins um so, in Jeremiah 29, verse 10, it says, For this is what the Lord says, When 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your welfare, not for your disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And who hopes for what they can see? I love it. I love it. You will call to me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore you to the place I deported you from. Um, let's see. And then he definitely, you know, he... Um, definitely has the power, uh, in first Chronicles 29, verse 12, it's David's prayer, you know, um, it says that I'm actually going to start at 10. Then David praised the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. David said, may you be praised Lord God. Of our father Israel from eternity to eternity. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty for everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom and you are exalted as head over all. Riches and honor come from you and you are the ruler of everything. Power and might are in your hand. It is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, God, we give you thanks and praise for your, your glorious name. It says, but who am I and who are your people that we should be able to give as generously as this? For everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your own hand. I love David. Thanks be to God for David. For we believe before you as foreigners and temporary, we, for we live before you as foreigners and temporary residents in your presence as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. <clears throat> it says, Yahweh, our God, all this wealth that we've provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand. Everything belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and that you 
are pleased with what is right. I have willingly given all these things with an upright heart. And now I've seen your people who are present here giving joyfully and willingly to you. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our ancestors, keep this desire forever in the hearts or in the thoughts of the hearts of your people and confirm their hearts towards you. I love that. See, it says, he, he, you know, it says, keep this desire forever in the thoughts of the hearts of your people and confirm their hearts towards you. He can do it. He has the power. He says, give my son Solomon a whole heart to keep and to carry out all your commands, your decrees and your statutes and to build the temple for which I have made provision. He says, then David said, the whole assembly praise the Lord your God. So the whole assembly praised the Lord God of their ancestors. They bowed down and paid homage to the Lord and to the king. Wow, the following day they offered sacrifices to the Lord and burnt offerings to the Lord, a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, and a thousand lambs, along with their drink offerings and sacrifice in abundance for all Israel. They ate and drank with great joy in the Lord's presence that day. So good. So good. Um, and so he owns everything. I love how, you know, and everything he gives is, it's still all his. It's still all from his hand. We don't earn or do anything ourselves because we see it all around the world. We see the wicked and, and clearly evil, you know, like, you know, people murder, you know, murders and, and, and like wars and things going on. And we know and recognize, you know, that evil, um, but it's all his and it's all in his hands and, and he knows and he just knows. It's like hot. I don't even know what else to say. Um, let's see. Psalm 121 also says, you know, the Lord, our protector it says, I lift my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to sl slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel doesn't, does not slumber or sleep. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter right by your side. The sun will not strike you by day or the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all harm. He will protect your life. The Lord will protect your coming and going both now and forever. He can do it. He can. Um, and Jesus says um, that he is the gate. You know, he says he's the way, the truth, and the life. He also says he's, you know, the gate. Um, and oops, that was upside down. John 10. Um, verse 9. Actually, I'm going to start, I started at verse 9, but I think I might as well go ahead. Actually, let's start at the beginning, John 10. I assure you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the door, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out when he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep will follow him because they recognize his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't recognize the voice of strangers. Jesus gave them this illustration, but they did not understand what he was telling them. So Jesus said again, I assure you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep don't didn't listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and out and come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. And um, what he means by that is, you know, the things that I get the most joy and the most filled and the most satisfied is this, is is telling about my Lord and Savior, whether it's in this capacity or out there. It doesn't matter. It's it's 
more satisfying than anything that you could possibly have. And that is why he's saying when you go out, you'll find pasture because you'll be, you'll be fed still. Like in a, in a world where you're not, it's hard to be fed. Oh, all of us, by the way. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired man, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them. He runs away when he sees the wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired man and doesn't care about the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me as the father knows me and I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep, but I have other sheep. They are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock one shepherd. This is why the father loves me because I'm laying down my life so I may take it up again. He says, no one takes it from me, but I lay down my own. He says, I have the right to lay it down and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. He laid down his life for us. That's why he hung on the cursed tree on the cross for us. So he could become sin and accursed for us. Um, you know, I, uh, Isaiah, you know, um, actually, I'm sorry. Um, there's one more before I go back into Isaiah and in Psalm 42, you know, it says, does your soul thirst for God? You know, are you seeking for God? Are you wanting to know God? It says that's, you know, um, he's telling you to come to, you know, um, and if you don't, Believe, you know, or you don't know. You can't know what you don't know. I'm not going to fault you for that. Um, Psalm 42. Longing for God. As a deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and appear before God? It says, my tears have been my food day and night. All day long, people say to me, where is your God? He says, I remember this as I pour out my heart, how I walked with many leading the festive procession to the house of God with joyful and thankful shouts. He says, why am I so depressed? Why is this turmoil within me? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. I am deeply depressed. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and the peaks of Hermon and Mount Hazar. So, so he's... He's showing, David is, he's showing you Jesus through David and his, you know, crazy back and forth emotions, which by the way, he had right to, you know, Saul was constantly coming to kill him and, you know, he, he just had a really hard life and granted he brought a lot of it on himself too, but don't we all? I think we all do. Um, but I want you to know that like, if you're in the deep, God's there too, like, he says, um, not in this psalm, but, you know, if you, <clears throat> you know, if I make my bed in the depths of Sheol, you are there. And so if you think you're in too deep, it's okay. David gets a deep calls to deep, deep. It says deep calls to deep in the roar of your water, waterfalls. All your breakers and your billows have swept over me. The Lord will send his faithful love by day. His song will be with me in the night, the prayer to God, the God of my life. I will say to my God, or say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about in sorrow because of the enemy's oppression? My adversaries taunt me as it is crushing my bones. Why all day long they say to me, where is your God? Why am I so depressed? Why this turmoil within me? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. That is, he's showing you how to kind of, you know, thirst for him still and still no hope and joy in the Lord, even though you're depressed. Like he, he lament is a good thing. That's why I did that video. Lament is a good thing. Isaiah 1, 18. Um, he invites us to, you know, settle, settle it, settle all our, you know, our transgressions. Um, and we can't do it ourselves. So, you know, if you're not there yet, it's okay. You know, God's got to give you the will, you know. But also, when you're hearing my words, I, he's telling me that you can harden your heart still, though, and not hear. And so there's a difference between, you know, n not listening and becoming offended by the word of God and 
<clears throat> you know, um, willingly coming to the Lord. And he's going to give you that will. Because he even says it. It's not by the will of man or will, by the will of God. Because then otherwise, you know, we'd be able to boast. And so when he's inviting you, you don't have to do this yourself. Okay. So it says, this is Isaiah 1. I'm going to start at verse 16. It says, wash yourselves, cleanse yourselves, remove your evil de deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do what is good. Seek justice. Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Come, let us discuss this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are as red as they they are as red as crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And um, just to make it clear, um, this is not our will. And so, it, when he says, "If you are willing," this is it. <laughs> You just have to come. <laughs> you just come. It's free. That's why Jesus came, and so he could prove it that it's free. And also, not just prove it, but but atone, you know, by his blood for our sins. And so he's already done the thing. He's already paid for every sin you've ever committed by his blood. <clears throat> and it says in John 1, um, I'm going to go ahead and go to verse 12. It says, but to all who did receive him... He gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. <laughs> the word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory. Hallelujah and amen. I love it. I love that. I love that it's free. And so that is why I'm speaking. That is why, you know, people are like, well, you know, you know, people are wondering why I'm putting out so much. It's because faith comes from hearing. And if you don't hear it, then, you know, you can't believe, you know, like, well, I suppose you could. I suppose God could just send the Holy Spirit down. Anything is possible in God. But I still am following the command to speak my testimony and to speak the word of God. Um because again it's that that's the burden that's really light is feeding people with the word of god he says he's the bread of life and it says that man can't live on bread alone but every word that proceeded from the mouth of god and so that is the bread of life that he's talking about this is how he feeds us <clears throat> um where is this again matthew 22 and 23 it's um you know it's basically it's talking about you know the the i remember now it's the yoke that religious people and the yoke of the world our sins and sins of others um are putting on us and this specifically is talking about you know the pharisees and they laid heavy burdens on following the law and there was like over 600 you know laws in the law you know like that they had come up with and God is trying to show us the truth in that and so that's my hope with reading Matthew 22 and 23 um, it says once more Jesus spoke to them in parables the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son he sent out his slaves to summon those invited to the banquet but they didn't want to come Again, he sent out other slaves and said, tell those who are invited, look, I prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went away to his own farm, another to his business. And the others seized his slaves, treated them outrageously and killed them. The king was enraged, so he sent his troops, destroyed those murderers and burned down their city. Then he told his slaves, the banquet is ready, but those who were invited are not, were not worthy. Therefore, it says, go to the roads. It says, sorry, go to where the roads exit the city and invite everyone you find to the banquet. 
So those slaves went out to the roads and gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. The wedding banquet was filled with guests. But when the king came in to view the guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed for a wedding. So he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him up hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing and teeth for many are invited, but few are chosen. And you know what he means is he's, he's clothes you, he's invited you and then he's going to clothe you for it. So if you're in the, the banquet, this party that you're invited to, you know, eternal life, and you're there, and, you know, you were invited and you came in in a different way, I don't know, maybe that means, you know, your own righteousness and by your own works and you weren't clothed in the righteousness of God. You know, I don't know what all that entails, what that, all that means, you know, um, but if you do not have a testimony that Jesus is your righteousness and that he is the son of God and that he is your Lord and he's your Messiah, then, you know, you're not clothed you know, and the Holy Spirit will clothe you. It says, um, then the Pharisees went and plotted how to trap him by what he said. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians teacher, they said, we know that you are truthful and teach truthfully the way of God. You defer to no one for you don't show partiality. It says, tell us therefore what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But perceiving their malice, Jesus said, why are you testing me hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. So they brought him a denarius. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked them. Caesar's, they said to him. And he said to them, therefore, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they went, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. The same day, some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came up to him and questioned him. Teacher, Moses said, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies, having no children, his brothers to marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first got married and died, having no offspring. He left his wife to his brother. The same happened to the second, also in the third, and so tall seven. Then the last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will she be of the seven? For they all had married her. Jesus answered them, you are deceived. Because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. For in the resurrection... They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now concerning the resurrection of the dead, haven't you read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. <clears throat> when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they came together. So like they're trying to find, you know, like the... Um, the way to trap Jesus into showing like he, his teachings are wrong. And, you know, Jesus is, is, is able to refute what they were trying to do every time because he knew, he knew that their spirits weren't aligned with his. When the Pharisees, oh yeah, so they, they joined together. While the Pharisees were together, or sorry, I got that person while when the pharisees heard that he silenced the sadducees they came together As, and one of them an expert in the law asked a question to test him teacher what command in the law is the greatest he said to them to love your the, love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind this is the greatest and most important command the second is like it love your neighbors yourself all the law and the prophets depend on these two commands while the Pharisees were together, Jesus questioned them. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? David's, they told him. He asked them, how is it then that David, inspired by the Spirit, calls him Lord? The Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And that is in Psalm 110.1. If David calls him Lord, how then 
can the Messiah be his son? No one was able to answer him at all. And from that day, no one dared to question him, any, question him anymore. And so that is where he's showing, like one of the ways that we're deceived is by questioning what it says. And so he was trying to show us that. Thank God, do you know? Thank God he's given us this. And then in 23, it says, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and his disciples. The scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses. Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it. But don't do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders. But they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. Like, so they're not even willing to try and help them carry these burdens as they're supposed to. They do everything to be observed by others. They enlarge their phylacteries, which um, is like their tassels and like, or I'm sorry, not their tassels. It's uh, small leather boxes containing the Old Testament texts worn by Jews on their arms and foreheads. I forgot about that part. And lengthen their tassels. They love the place of honor at banquets, the front seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called rabbi by the people. But as for you, do not be called rabbi because you have one teacher and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father because you have one father who is in heaven. And do not be called masters either because you have one master, the Messiah, the greatest among you will be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So if you're already in a humbled situation, you're already weary and heavy burdened and, and weighed down by life, well, that's better yet because it makes it easier for you to come. <laughs> um, it says, and do not, or, sorry, I want to make sure I finish that last sentence too. It says, because you have one father who is in heaven. That's okay. And do not be called masters either, because you have one master, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You lock up the kingdom of heaven from people, but for you don't go in, and you don't allow those entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You devour widows' houses and make long prayers just for show. This is why you will receive a harsher punishment. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel over the land and sea to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as fit for hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides who say whoever takes an oath by the sanctuary means nothing. But whoever takes an oath by the gold of the sanctuary is bound by his oath. Blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the sanctuary that sanctified the gold? Also, whoever takes an oath by the altar means nothing, but whoever takes an oath by the gift that is on, it is on is bound by his oath. Blind people, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, the one who takes an oath by the altar takes an oath by it and everything on it. The one who takes an oath by the sanctuary takes an oath by it and by him who dwells in it. And the one who takes an oath by heaven takes an oath by God's throne and by him who sits on it. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a tithe or a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, yet gulp down a camel. So it's like you're you know, picking on... You know, the people, the weak people in your church and your, you know, your synagogues and you're, you know, getting rid of them and, but swallow, you know, a whole bunch of sin and do a bunch of whole sin yourself. It says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first clean the inside of a cup so the outside may also become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and every impurity. 
In the same way, on the outside, you seem righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so if you're, you know, one of those people that are looking at the religious people and you're like, I don't want to be that. Jesus agrees. He agrees. He's, he's saying it too. <laughs> That's why I keep talking. Because I agree. Um, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You build the tombs of the prophets and des decorate the monuments of the righteous. And you say, if we have lived in the days of our fathers, we wouldn't have taken part with them in shedding the prophets' bloods. So you therefore testify against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's sins. Snakes, brood vipers, how can you escape being condemned to hell? This is why I'm sending you prophets, sages, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will flog in your synagogues and hound from town to town. So all the righteous blood shed on earth will be charged to you from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Bechariah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. I assure you all these things will come on this generation. And, you know, he laments, I guess I'll finish it. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, she who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. So your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will never see me again until you say, he who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. And so he's showing us there in the rebukes to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and the scribes and the people of that time that were, you know, not liking him welcoming the sinners. You know, they they felt like, you know, we've worked our whole lives, you know, and, and we're righteous. And how can you just, you know, open this the door to heaven essentially to these people? And he's showing them that what they've been doing by placing all these rules and all these things on people that they have to follow, it's, it's, it's not the way that he's trying to teach us. Um, the law of love is what it is. Um, you know, love God completely and in every way and love your neighbor. And in the story of the Good Samaritan, he teaches us that our neighbor is someone in need. And we go, you know, the extra mile for him or for them, you know. Um, the cat, you know, this person had to leave, you know, but he said, here is, you know, I think a couple days extra wages. Um, and if, you know, you need any, you know, at the end where he dropped the, the person off that had been left on the side of the road, beaten and robbed. And naked and this good Samaritan you know after the the two religious people walked by you know the good the Samaritan the, the quote the non-religious the you know the look down upon the Samarian he was the one that got off his donkey or horse or whatever it was and he lifted him up and he took him to this inn and he gave he told the guy if it goes above what I've given you then I will pay you back and he made sure that that person was going to be cared for. Um, it says in Romans 3, no one is declared righteous by the law. Um, and thank God, because we can't. <laughs> you guys, we can't. And so I know I keep saying that, but I think it's because I think a lot of people need to hear it. And so that's why I keep saying it. And if, and, Romans 3 20 it says for no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law because the knowledge of sin comes through the law it's you know but now apart from God's law so with Christ you're apart from God's law God's righteousness has been revealed attested by the law and the prophets that is God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe since there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presenting, presented him as appropriation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his 
restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be may be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. You're declared righteous by God. Thank God. Um, and, you know, Peter, or I apologize, in 1 John 5, it also confirms what Jesus is saying about his yoke being easy and his burden light. Um, in 1 John 5, John confirms that in verse 3. It says, um, everyone, well, I'm going to start at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. This is how we know we love that we love God's children when we love God and obey his commands. So this is what love for God is to keep his commands. It says now his commands are not a burden because whatever has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victor victory that has conquered the world. Our faith. It's a gift. And who is the one who conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Um, it's the certainty of God's testimony is what it goes on to say. It says, Jesus Christ, he is the one who came by water and blood, not by water only, but by water and by blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. If we accept the testimony of men, God's testimony is greater. Because it is God's testimony that he has given about his son. The one who believes in the son of God has this testimony within him. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. That's it. You know that you're safe. <laughs> the one who has the son has life. The one who doesn't have the son of God does not have life. I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life so that you may know. It says now this is the confidence we have before him. Whenever we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked for him for. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin that does not bring death, he should ask and God will give life to him. To those who commit sin that doesn't bring death, there is sin that brings death. I'm not saying he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin and there is sin that does not bring death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin, but the one who is born of God keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. And we know that the son of God has come and has given us an understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one that is in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, we familia, guard yourself from idols. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> in Jeremiah, so the Old Testament also confirms, you know, what Jesus says about that we'll find rest. Um, when we follow him, you know, it says, come all to me, you know, who are weary and burdened. And he says that, you know, he'll give us rest. Um, his yoke is easy. Jeremiah 6, um, 16, it also says that as well. It says, this is what the Lord says. Stand by the roadways and look. Ask about the ancient paths. Which is the way to what is good? Then take it and find rest for yourselves. But they protested, we won't. I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen for the sound of the ram's horn. But they protested, we won't listen. Therefore, listen, you nations, and you witness. Learn what the charge is against them. Listen, earth, I'm about to bring disaster on these people for the fruit of their plotting and for they have paid no attention to my word. They have rejected my instruction. What used to me is frankincense from Shabba or sweet cane from a distant land. Your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Your sacrifices do not please me. Therefore, this is what the Lord God says. I'm going to place stumbling blocks before these people. Fathers and sons together will stumble over them. Friends and neighbors will also perish. But it says, 
you know, he says, if, you know, you ask anything in the will of God, so if you ask about the ancient pathways, which is the way to what is good, it says, then take it and find rest for yourselves. And, and this is it. It's Jesus. He is that path. Um, and, you know, I guess I'll end with Philippians 2. And uh, Jesus did it too. So he's not asking you to do anything that he hasn't already done. He also had to be humbled to learn obedience. Um, this is labeled Christian humility. It says, if then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility considers others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every name knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under, earth, under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, to the glory of God the Father. It says, so then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to desire, both to desire and to work out his good purpose. It says, do everything without grumbling and arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world. Hold firmly to the message of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or label for, labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Hallelujah and amen, you guys. I just, I love his word. And I love that he has given us such a, you know, such wonderful promises and such, you know, um, a wonderful gift of life in life abundance. And so, maybe with the normal um, prayer that I do pray for you guys, I do, because, you know, um, it's a gift, and Jesus wants everybody to have it. And so, um, that is why I'm so consistent. It says in the verse 6, 24 through 26, May Yahweh bless you and protect you. May Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh look with favor on you and give you shalom. Hallelujah and amen. I love you, me, familia. I love everyone on this planet. I love each and every single one of you. And that's because Jesus loved you first. That is why he sent us his son. So we could have it for free. Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> Our burdens are gone. All right. God bless you guys. Bye.